endangered wild horses are returning to the steppes of Kazakhstan for the first time in 200 years. It's part of an ambitious scheme to return them to their original habitat. When the last wild Brazilski's horse vanished from the Central Asian steppe in the late 1960s, most experts believed the species had reached the end of its road. Extinct in the wild and clinging to survival in a few distant zoos, these rugged, thick-necked horses seemed destined to live out their days behind fences. But then, decades later, they released a herd of these near-extinct horses into China's desert. What happened next shocked biologists from all over the world. Path to Extinction The Brazilski's horse, or Equus ferris Brzwalski, has long held a unique status in the animal kingdom as the last truly wild horse species on Earth. Unlike feral horses such as the Mustang, which descended from domesticated ancestors, this horse has never been domesticated. Its native range historically extended across the steppes of Central Asia, especially in modern-day Mongolia and parts of northern China. These horses are genetically and physically distinct from domestic horses. They have a stocky build, a thick neck, shorter legs, a large head, a stiff upright mane, and notably lack the forelock that domestic breeds have. This physical robustness was well suited to the harsh, arid conditions of the Central Asian plains where seasonal extremes and minimal vegetation define survival. The horse was first brought to scientific attention by Russian geographer and explorer Nikolai Miklohomoklay during an expedition to Mongolia in the late 1870s. Although the local people, including Mongolian nomads, were well acquainted with these animals, it was he who collected the first physical specimen that led to the species' formal scientific description in 1881. The species was named in his honor. This scientific recognition began to draw global interest to the animal, even as its numbers in the wild began to dwindle. The decline of the horse was precipitated by a confluence of anthropogenic and natural factors. Human expansion into Central Asia in the early 20th century brought about increasing competition between wildlife and domesticated livestock, particularly sheep, goats, and camels. This led to overgrazing of the natural grasslands, thereby reducing the food available to wild species. Horses, already slow to reproduce and requiring vast ranges for grazing, struggled to compete. Overhunting, sometimes for meat, more often for sport or capture, also played a significant role. The horses were pursued relentlessly by trophy hunters and specimen collectors from Europe and Russia, further diminishing their already shrinking population. Additionally, the introduction of firearms— Motorized transport, and more sophisticated hunting techniques in the early 1900s allowed humans to access and exploit even the most remote habitats. The cumulative stress of hunting pressure and habitat loss was exacerbated by extreme winters, locally known as suds, which periodically devastate steppe ecosystems. During these events, heavy snow, freezing temperatures, and icy conditions prevent animals from accessing grass leading to mass starvation. Horses, with no food reserves and little human intervention at the time, were especially vulnerable. Each severe winter drastically reduced wild populations, and as sightings became rarer, it became clear the species was on the brink. The last confirmed sighting of a wild Brazilski's horse was in 1969 in the Dzungarian Gobi region of southwestern Mongolia. After that, the species was declared extinct in the wild by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. What remained were only a handful of individuals, just 12 to 14 viable horses, scattered across European zoos and private collections. These were descendants of approximately 13 wild-caught horses, mostly taken from Mongolia between 1899 and 1902, plus a few foals born to captured mares, but the story does not end here. No, in fact, this was just the beginning. International Captive Breeding Program The foundation of modern horse herds lies in the work of a few dedicated institutions, breeders, and conservationists. Key individuals such as Dr. and Amore of Germany and Dr. Christian Schroeder of the Munich Zoo were instrumental in the early decades of the 20th century in tracing the pedigrees of captive individuals and identifying the remaining genetically pure horses those not hybridized with domestic horses, which had occurred in some facilities. In 1959, a pivotal moment came with the creation of a formal stud book, managed centrally in Europe, 
which documented the lineage of every known horse. This stud book would become the backbone of the global breeding strategy. By the 1970s and early 80s, the breeding population, though still critically low, was distributed across several institutions, including the Prague Zoo in the Czech Republic, Hellebrunn Zoo in Germany, the Escanianova Biosphere Reserve in Ukraine, and the San Diego Zoo in the USA. The Prague Zoo in particular would emerge as one of the leading stewards of the species, maintaining one of the largest and most genetically diverse herds. In North America, the Bronx Zoo and the Minnesota Zoo were also active participants in breeding efforts. These institutions formed the core of an emerging international network, coordinated under the European Endangered Species Program, EP, and its counterpart in North America, the Species Survival Plan, SSP, managed by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, AZA. Under these frameworks, breeding recommendations were issued based on genetic assessments to maximize heterozygosity and minimize inbreeding depression. Genetic material, both live animals and semen, was exchanged between facilities to preserve diversity across continents. One of the most notable scientific contributions during this period was the use of artificial insemination and later embryo transfer to enable the reproduction of genetically valuable individuals without physical relocation. This was especially important for aging stallions or for pairing individuals that were not compatible. As early as the 1980s, scientists began using cryopreservation to store semen from genetically rare stallions. These techniques allowed conservationists to manage reproduction across distance and time, bypassing logistical constraints that would otherwise limit pairings. Throughout the 1980s and 1990s, these combined efforts began to show results. The captive population grew steadily. In 1985, the global number of Brazilski's horses was still under 400. By 1990, that number had risen to over 750 individuals. By 2000, the number exceeded 1,200, with a genetically managed population spread across Europe, North America, Australia, Russia, China, and Mongolia. More than 95% of these horses could trace their lineage back to 13 wild founders, with an even smaller number, around 7 to 8 individuals, contributing the bulk of the genetic material. This meant that the species was still genetically bottlenecked but careful pairing and controlled breeding kept the inbreeding coefficient from rising too quickly. During this time, specialized breeding centers were developed with the sole aim of preparing horses for eventual reintroduction. One such was the Le Villaret Reserve in southern France, managed by the Association TOC, founded in 1990. The reserve housed horses in semi-wild conditions, simulating the environment of the Asian steppe to help animals regain natural behaviors. Another was the Wilds in Ohio, USA, a large conservation center that bred Brazilski's horses under minimal human interference. The movement toward reintroduction began to take form in the late 1980s, spurred by increasing captive numbers and improved genetic data. In 1992, the first successful reintroduction took place in Hustai National Park in Mongolia. Horses from European zoos were flown in and acclimatized to local conditions before release. These early reintroductions included 15 to 16 individuals per cohort, with multiple waves continuing over the next decade. All individuals were genetically screened prior to release to ensure maximal diversity. By the end of the 1990s, captive populations were robust enough to support multiple rewilding programs, including in Mongolia, Kazakhstan, and China. Captive breeding had evolved from emergency genetic triage into a globally coordinated conservation success story, built on decades of meticulous record-keeping, data sharing, and cross-border cooperation. But the work was far from done. 